This meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. We will call the uh, Public Health Board meeting to order. I believe we have all of our board members attending either in person or via um, phone today. Uh, the meeting agenda uh, starts with the meeting minutes approval. Is we that do, correct? Yep. The consent agenda is the meeting of minutes from our January 15th meeting. So can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes from January 15th? Motion. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Aye. aye. Oh, yeah, that was a strong eye. Thank you. Uh, good job, Sal. Uh, we really have mainly just updates today for our, for our team, but uh, there's been a lot of activity going on, a lot of work, and frankly, quite a bit of good news. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monica to brief the board on what's transpired. Thanks everybody and good afternoon. It's good to see you virtually or in person. Um, so just a few updates today. I thought I'd go through um, just an update of the department as well as um, the status of COVID and where we're at right now. So as far as our departmental updates, um, we've had quite a few things going on. Um, I I don't think we mentioned it at the last meeting, but the vital record system and the state level has uh, changed over. It changed over at the new year. It's created a lot of problems for people all over the state um, that they, they rolled out this system. Um, so we are not immune from those problems that have been happening statewide. Um, and in fact, um, I think Dr. Box addressed this at the weekly conference last week, that this was an ongoing issue that they're working towards. Um, additionally, one of the things that we learned is that um, they left out all of the municipal health departments when they were building the, um, the new system. So they are now patching it. Um, so we are getting things rolling through again um, and are functioning again, which is great. Um, still some bugs to work out though. So that's where we're at with vital records, um, but we should be um, fully back 
and running to the extent that the system is running statewide. <laughs> Um, in health education updates, um, as you know, we have a health educator. She's been working really hard for the last few months. Um, her focus right now is on our website, making sure facts are up to date on the website, um, adjusting as things come out. Um, I know that she's done a lot of work on our vaccine information um, on our website, as well as some other uh, items as they come up of, of prominence. We're trying to get some education out through social media as well. She's collaborating with the schools. Um, she's also doing some inspections in the schools. So she's been collaborating with all the area schools to go out and just do some kind of COVID inspections to see if there are opportunities for improvement with mitigation measures. This is not a punitive assessment in any way. This is not meant to be regulatory. It's, it's meant to be educational and just look for opportunities um, to see if there's increased spacing we can do or any of those other measures um, that we can take to make sure that um, everyone is safe um, in the educational environment. Um, it, event approvals continue. Um, and again, those are mandated under the governor's orders as well as our public health orders um, for events over certain sizes. Um, so our health educator is the one that is primarily addressing the event approvals. Um, I will say it is a little bit confusing just because um, some of these events, we're starting to see spring and summer event um, requests right now, and even some into the fall. And it's hard to know if we're even gonna need to do this at that time, or it, you know, at what level we should be recommending precautions. So we're typically just sticking with our standard precautions or asking that they defer their public health event approval until they're a little bit closer to the event. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, public health nursing, um, we, we've been quite busy, as I've reported before. Um, COVID's not the only thing out there. We also have 72 other reportable diseases. Fortunately, we haven't seen all of them in Fishers. Um, I think since the beginning of the year, we've worked on 10 additional reportable disease investigations, um, so not huge numbers. We're also treating um, five individuals for latent TB and monitoring a few others. Um, we've had fewer than five lead cases, but we have had a couple of lead cases come up um, as well as a number of animal bites. So I'm not sure if there's something going on with this new year. People seem to be stressed out if it's <laughs> leading to some dog bites. Uh, maybe it's the increase in puppies, who knows? <laughs> but, but we do have to follow up on those and make sure that you know, every, all the animals in question have been vaccinated and, and recommend prophylaxis if needed. So those have been keeping us pretty busy. In addition to that, um, you know, we've been continuing to work on our vaccination program. We have enrolled with the VFC program, um, which is the Vaccines for Children program through the state. So we have those vaccines um, in receipt. We've got everybody tested to do TB tests and um, we're nearly ready to open um, kind of our vaccine and TB testing uh, clinic. In environmental health matters, um, we rolled into a new year, so we have um, started with permitting again with the restaurants. We've gotten um, 282 food permits um, enrolled for the new year for 2021. Those All of the restaurant permits are due at the beginning of the year, so we've been going through there and making sure everybody's getting their updated permits and then um, making sure that all of the restaurants in the area are updated along with our pools. Um, most of those seasonal pools, of course, don't start till April. That permitting process is a little bit later. Um, but our annual pools, we've, we're trying to get all of those inspected um, before the seasonal pools open up so that we can be done with those. We have started reinspecting some of the restaurants. And um, of course, we have all kinds of other permits that come up for farmers markets and food trucks and, and those kinds of things. So we continue to do those. Um, and that's going at a pretty good pace. Um, let's see, our environmental team also does some of the COVID inspections. So on our website, we have a link to report any COVID-related complaints. Um, so they continue to go out and inspect those. And, and primarily, it's an education-based approach, um, which for the most part, we have pretty good success with um, to the levels that we're able to enforce it. We are working with our police department when necessary to find other options for um, reporting any repeat offenders. Um, let's see, we also have um, our staff are getting certified in various different things. Um, one, our pool inspector, water inspector is working on a watershed certification right now so that we'll be ready for open water testing and some other additional recommendations as we head into the summer. 
Uh, we're also, re you know, continuing to review review our health code um, to recommend any adjustments that might be needed. Um, now that we've been going for nine months, um, you know, we may have some some little tweaks or things that we may recommend to you guys going forward, um, and see if there's any other um, items that we need to propose. And um, just to mention about fees, we are collecting fees now. So that all of those restaurant permits that we're collecting now, last year we gave everybody a free pass, as it were. We honored their Hamilton County permits um, and issued a Fisher's Health Department permit. But this year we are starting to collect fees for those. Um, so we have started seeing those come in. Um, and then just a COVID update. So I just updated this uh, graph about an hour ago from our website, and I'm very pleased to report this is the first time in a long time that the percent positivity has been under 10%. Um, so that just happened today. <laughs> our case incidence rate is um, 30, which is the lowest it's been in a long time as well. Um, in order to move into our orange level, if you guys remember way back when, our, um, our core metrics would have our percent positivity under 10% and then our case incidence rate under 25. So we are getting much, much closer and certainly closer than we've been in a really long time. If um, So this is pretty significant decreases. Our, our highest number of cases that we've had in a day throughout this outbreak was on December 28th and we had 172 cases that day, which is a lot. Um, so again, for these are 14-day averages on a case incidence rate. So it's per 100,000 of the population. Our population is around 93,000. So the case incidence rate doesn't exactly correlate with the number of cases, but it's pretty close. Um, let's see, our highest percent positivity rate that we've seen was in the beginning of January, and that was 24.2%. So you can see we've, done, we've come a long way going down on those rates um, just in the past month because it was only a month ago that we were at our highest ever percent positivity rate. The last time we've been close to the numbers that we're at today was November the 3rd. So we had just canceled Boobash um, because the cases were rising so fast. It's hard even to get the perspective about <laughs> how high, you know, whether we could even realize they were going to go as high as they did. Like right now it looks like we've gone way down, but at this time, at these rates in November, we were very, very worried and closing things down. Now the difference, of course, is that right now we're on the way down. Um, still not certain what multiple factors may be leading to this dramatic decline. It's very, very fast um, to be declining. Um, I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Um, but I don't know that anyone fully understands the variety of factors that are leading to this. Um, it could be a combination of, um, of the number of people that have already been affected in the community and um, getting towards some level of immunity from natural inf infection plus um, the number of people who have at least received their first vaccine, which is about 13% of the community that has received the first vaccine and about 3% that have received the second. Um, there may be other factors at play as well. Um, as far as other news related to COVID, there are some new variants out there that have been coming up and making the news. Um, the CDC is reporting off of three of them, one of them in Brazil, one in South Africa, and then the UK one. They are expecting that the UK variant will be the most dominant strain in the United States um, by March. It is estimated to be at up to 50% more infectious um, than the current strains that are circulating. Um, as of Monday, the state had reported 12 cases of this new variant, but it's likely much more um, because they're not testing them all across the board. It's kind of a random sampling technique, and the CDC is supposed to increase that sampling. We don't know if it's more deadly. There are some speculations that it might be, possibly just because it's more infectious. Um, so uh, hopefully we can get as many people vaccinated as possible, and hopefully that will be an effective strategy to combat that new variant. As far as our hotline team, I don't think I put that on the bullets, but the hotline team, um, we do have a COVID hotline. Our hotline team has been very busy. Um, I know all, in all of 2020, they made over 10,000 or they received or answered over 10,000 calls. Um, and it's pretty incredible. <laughs> so um, they are comprised of 25 different employees from eight different departments around the city. 
which is amazing just to think of the team effort that is involved in all of this. Um, and the hotline team is just one small example of that. In 2021, they fielded over 2,500 calls already in a month and a half. Um, the customer service team also has been helping us with some of the location changes as we moved our vaccine site from Technology Drive over to the old Marsh building on 116th. Um, we've had to make sure that everyone is notified of those location changes. Um, and then they also helped us reschedule some appointments that needed to be spread out throughout the day before the state system was able to um, organize that process for second doses a little bit better. As far as testing, um, we have tested over 40,000 people through the city testing link, um, which is really incredible. And we've tested an additional 15,000 through the state testing link. So we have tested over 55,000 people, or more, more appropriately, we have conducted over 55,000 tests um, through our testing site, through the drive-through testing, or through the technology drive location. We have seen a pretty um, big decrease in demand since January. Um, at the beginning of January, we we're seeing on average 350 a day, and it could be as many as 600 a day, um, particularly on Mondays. Those are our busiest days. Um, as of this, this past week, our average per day was 227. So it's gone down a bit. Um, you know, they're still busy, um, but uh, not busy enough to warrant two testing locations at this time. So we have kind of scaled back staff a little bit and we can easily scale that back up if needed. Um, as far as our contact tracing, we continue to do contact tracing on everyone. As you guys may remember, um, the state took over contact tracing in May and then, um, and then they kind of started handing it back um, because they weren't able to keep up with it. Um, our tracers have been there the whole time. They continue to conduct contact tracing and give recommendations um, to people who are identified as part of that contact tracing process. They're able to notify 100% of them within 24 hours of the time that we receive the report that they're positive, whether they be tested through our site or whether um, they're reported to us through the state because the state is no longer actively making calls for contacts. Um, let's see. So they have handled since January 1,435 positives through the City of Fishers testing link and an additional 1,975 um, through state reports. So it's not a small number <laughs> of um, positive cases that we are doing contact investigations on. Our compliance rate for contact tracing remains a lot higher with the folks that we have tested through our site that we're able to contact immediately. Um, it's 67% compliance with the full entire contact tracing process, including divulging of contacts. Um, they were able to get a hold of more people than that, but not everybody is, is, is willing or able to give uh, information as far as who their contacts are. By contrast, the, um, the information that we get from the state is often delayed, and the success rate for us following up on it, however many days later, is about 30%. So there's a pretty big difference in our ability to get to that contract tracing faster. Um, as far as current orders, if you guys have been following along, the governor um, continues to update the color-coded rating scale at the state level, and those have orders associated with them. Um, right now, the county, according to the state's rating scale, is in orange um, as far as the orders that need to be followed. As far as where they're at on the metrics by the county, they are actually in the yellow stage. They went there um, on Wednesday. But um, under the governor's orders, you have to stay in the previous color for two weeks before you can move down, even if your metrics say you're in a, a level down. So if you guys recall, our um, scale has always been a little bit more um, stringent than theirs. Um, and again, we came out with ours uh, a little bit before um, they unveiled theirs. Neither of us have changed those criteria. Um, let's see. Um, we did update the Fisher's Health Department um, public health orders last week. Um, we eliminated the bar seating requirement, the no bar seating requirement, and the not more than two people in the lobby requirement. Other than that, they've stayed pretty consistent. There's only a few additional things on top of the governor's orders. Um, and um, as far as like gathering restrictions are a little bit more stringent, but um, people are able to submit a request um, to increase that 
if they need to through our event approval system um, until it is capped at where the governor's orders are. Um, there's been a few recommendations that have come out lately um, as far as quarantine guidelines, um, both for vaccinated persons and for schools. The, school, the State Department of Health um, came out with some new school guidelines recently. The CDC has come out with some quarantine guidelines as it relates to people um, who've been vaccinated. And um, we have been making sure that all of our schools are informed of what those changes are, um, but it is ultimately their prerogative on whether they want to follow um, something that is not um, as recommended as other guidelines. So we haven't taken any particular stance on it as far as whether they should go with a 14 day or a 10 day or a seven day, particularly for the schools. But most of the schools have told us that the seven day and 10 day are very difficult to manage because they come with different requirements for kids in those different timeframes. Um, so most of the schools in the area are sticking with a 14 day timeframe for quarantines. As far as um, our vaccines, that's our happiest news. Um, I, those of you that came out and saw the vaccine site, um, I think uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> and I enjoy being there as well. I'm gonna be doing vaccinations tomorrow. And I'm pretty excited about it. We have had over 32,000 submissions to our vaccine interest survey that we unveiled, um, which is pretty incredible. So that is where we, where people can submit if they wanna be on our homebound list. So we have done some homebound vaccinations. That's where they can submit if they wanna be on our standby list um, or if they wanna be just actively notified when we know that their group is identified. So when the state, for example, decreased their age criteria to 65 to 69 year olds, we were able to immediately send an email to all of those individuals that had identified in those age groups that they were now eligible to receive the vaccine and they were able to get signed up pretty quickly. So, um, and we had a lot of good feedback from that process. We use the standby list feature um, every day in the clinic because at the end of the day, we have to use up all the doses in the vial. Mm -hmm. So we do go, go down our standby list um, based on age and risk, risk criteria, so we are currently still um, calling people on the standby list who are in the 65 to 69 year old categories um, who may have appointments that are scheduled several weeks out. So this is an opportunity for them to get in a little bit earlier. Um, if we can't find um, people in those age criteria that are um, able to get to the site in time, our next group that we call is the next risk group down. So the state has identified 60 to 64 year olds being the next group. So those are the next people that we'll call on the list. Our allocations for vaccine um, have been pretty steady. Um, the state has allocated us a thousand doses per week. So that is what our appointments are set at. As you guys know who have been to the site, we could easily handle many, many, many more. Um, we are just waiting for that vaccine. Right now the focus seems to be on expanding access to all of the potential sites that could administer vaccine. So they are focusing on putting that into some of the um, pharmacies as well as the um, FQHCs or the health centers. Um, and then hopefully the health departments will get some more vaccine and we can expand our operations um, with these reports nationally that they're coming out with more vaccines. So we're very hopeful about that, we're ready. Um, and in the meantime, we're trying to be patient. <laughs> we did start second doses this week. Um, so this is, we're now a month into our vaccination campaign. So this week is the week that we're, people are due for their second doses. Um, since we are giving the Moderna vaccine, it's 28 days um, and it's been a month. So um, we're very excited to get lots of people completed in their vaccination series. I see today you vaccinated a hundred year old. Uh, yeah. um, that's pretty incredible. I know. So. <laughs> Yeah, it is pretty incredible. It's, it's so gratifying to see people who have been um, kind of cooped up in their houses and you know really being so careful um, because they have so many risk factors and to be able to see them and offer them this uh, you know, life-saving vaccine has just been incredible and gratifying. So we do have lots and lots and lots of people who want to work in the vaccine clinic more than we have spaces available because we don't have enough vaccine to justify having that many people on site. Um, but it is pretty great to see the community coming together that way and to, and to be able to experience um, some of that joy with people who are just so happy to be there and to be able to get the vaccine. We have uh, over 9,000 appointments scheduled um, that we've either completed or are waiting for just on what's open right now. 
on um, the state's website for vaccine appointments. Um, we have done 3,404 vaccines so far in um, our vaccination facility. Um, we've also partnered with EMS to do um, three of our assisted living facilities um, that hadn't yet been covered by the federal partnerships. Um, so that covered um, almost 200 people. And so we'll do second rounds of that towards the end of the month. Um, and then we've also, again, used our vaccination interest survey to identify homebound individuals. And we have um, administered 43 vaccines to homebound individuals. And we continue to get those requests coming in. So we have a schedule set up for that to get those folks scheduled if they hadn't already um, managed to do that. Um, so our EMS team are, are sending out teams to complete those visits as well. Um, so I think we're ahead of all of it. I'm not sure what else we can do um, other than continue our operations and await more vaccine on that front because we've, I think, come ahead of all of, of the, the high need risk groups um, that we can get to in that way. And that's the COVID update. I would be more than happy to entertain any questions um, or recommendations that you guys might have. That was a lot. Uh, <laughs> Anything from the board, uh, questions, comments, recommendations for Monica? This is a pleasant uh, uh, scenario where we're not dealing with difficult decisions to be made. So I appreciate your work and your staff's work uh, for sure. It's been incredible to watch the team rally and get things done. So very much appreciated. Um, is there any other business items that we need to cover today, Monica? Or Chris? I think there's a legislative update that Chris was going to cover. Yeah, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Monica. I think Monica hit it um, during her presentation, so I won't belabor a lot of the points. But uh, as she mentioned, Governor Holcomb earlier this month did issue two new executive orders. One of them extended the uh, public health emergency disaster through March 1st, 2021, and uh, that's been in place largely since last March. Uh, that's been subsequently extended by the governor periodically throughout the pandemic. The second uh, executive order was his extension of the county-based restrictions that Monica mentioned, and those will be in place through February 28th. Our public health order that was issued is in effect until March 8th, and so we'll have a little bit of an overlap at the end of this month to see where the state goes and to get a better understanding of what we're gonna do with respect to our order. Uh, at the State House, as I mentioned, I think during our uh, meeting last month, there are a litany of bills out there that are seeking to limit the effect of either the governor's role during the pandemic or the local health department's role or Monica or Dr. Lane uh, in those regards. Um, the one that I would update you on is House Bill 1123, which was authored by Representative Lehman, passed the House. Um, that bill uh, brings and calls for uh, the ability of the General Assembly to have a special session during times of uh, the pandemic, during local emergency disasters, uh, so that the General Assembly can weigh in on the governor's decision to have further extensions. What it also does for local health departments is, if you have in a, a public health order that's more restrictive than what is included in the governor's uh, current executive order, that local health order has to be approved by the city council and the mayor separately. So going forward, if this bill were to ever pass, there could be further restrictions and limitations on your ability or the health department's ability, I should say, in passing uh, a health order on its own. So we'll continue to be apprised of, of all the legislation that's going on. Next week is the final week uh, for bill hearings, uh, I believe in the House and the Senate before bills get flipped to the other side of the house so we'll continue to keep the board updated any questions for chris any other additional items the board would like to bring up at this time seeing none i guess i'll entertain a motion to adjourn is there a motion motion, motion. is there a second all in favor please say aye aye meaning adjourned aye.